Good evening, I'm Susan Mulholland, and welcome to Artbeat. This month, we'll be visiting Susan Zoon, who is best described as a postmodern Cubist painter here at the Four Corners Gallery in Lambertville, New Jersey. But first, we'll travel to Coopersburg, Pennsylvania, and visit with abstract glass blower Steve Tobin. Steve Tobin is an innovative glass blower who is not bound by tradition. His 12 foot high glass sculptures are the largest blown glass pieces ever created. Steve lives in an old farmhouse in Coopersburg, Pennsylvania. It is here at his barn studio that he and his three assistants, his goat, and his dog work in creating his latest sculptures entitled Cocoons. Good dog again. I work with uh, a, a team of people. Uh, I work with uh, three assistants um, because my pieces are so large. Um, most uh, glass blowing is done alone or with one assistant, but I need uh, three people to help me turn the blowpipe. These are some of the larger pieces uh, ever made and require uh, um, a lot of relief, physical relief, handing the piece off from one person to the other so we can rest. So we, we really work uh, together as a team and the feeling and the moment of the team is very important in the piece. If uh, everybody's enthusiastic and energetic, then we have uh, the energy to com complete a piece uh, with finesse. If we're tired and drag dragged down, then um, the piece, uh, it reflects in the piece. I take uh, about an hour to build up the glass on the blowpipe uh, with the colored patterns and the layers that I want. And then I reheat the piece and elongate it. At that point, I hand it off to one of my assistants and I will add a spiral around the piece. This is uh, the, the most difficult part of the process because the thin neck of the piece is supporting a nine foot uh, long sculpture. And at that point, it can uh, fall off at any time. When I separate the piece from the blowpipe, um, I just touch the neck with a drop of water and that cracks the hot glass and the piece falls off. Steve has just briefly explained a process which is not as simple as he has made it sound. It is a fascinating choreography of men, fire, molten glass, heat, sweat, and passion. Steve acts as the artistic commander who shouts commands which are unhesitatingly followed. Now you are going to experience the process Steve just explained from the inside of his studio as he and his team execute a glass cocoon. You are lucky though because you won't experience the sauna-like atmosphere which normally accompanies glass blowing. You will hear the constant hissing of the furnaces. You'll see the small orb of glass grow and become shaped into an elongated piece of sculpture. And you'll watch a finely tuned team create a thing of beauty. An interesting aspect of working with the glass and the furnaces is learning how individually to deal with the, the heat that is put out by the glass. You have to get very close to it and your clothes will start smoldering and, and you have to learn how to 
move to let the heat pass through you or by you and you have to learn how to set your mind so that the heat doesn't bother you because if you don't let the heat pass through you then you're not going to keep your mind on your work uh, uh, that's a real factor some people cannot get near the furnaces even if they want to and uh, it's how they set their mind I designed my furnaces to uh, make the piece that uh, I have in my drawings so that each piece of equipment is designed to make a certain piece. Uh, my equipment is versatile so that I can do a range of work. What makes my equipment unique is the size of it. Uh, I'm blowing pieces up to 12 feet long so I have ovens that are 12 feet long. I use a forklift to move heavy pieces around the studio when I can't lift them by hand. So some furnaces are set to take molds in and out of with a forklift. I interviewed Steve's two Japanese assistants and asked them why they are in America working with Steve. He's a great artist. And Steve Tobin's studio is uh, very open, very free. That's why I can do anything. He's doing a great, uh, I mean, such crazy blowing. He blow, uh, Eight feet piece, nine feet piece, that's uh, incredible for me. And I can, I can learn a lot. So uh, this is a great uh, experience for me. And also, uh, I'm interested about his way. Uh, he, he always uh, growing up, 
getting better and better. So that's why I like him. Well, I feel that uh, Steve's studio is uh, one of the more progressive studios in the United States, and uh, I think in the years to come, certainly people are going to have to follow his lead. Uh, the things I'm sure that will come out of this studio will be, uh, uh, what can I say, it's going to break new ground in uh, glass in the United States, and I think people are going to be chasing Steve for a couple of years, trying to uh, do work in the same quality. and. Um, so I feel as this is the best place for me. It's the place where my talent can come out the most. So I'm very happy to be here. We were blowing in the Murano in Venice and uh, people just accepted us so, um, the acceptance was overwhelming. And of course, uh, they accepted us through glass. Their respect was through what Steve could do, through what they saw us making. And, uh, and um, what can I say, when people turn around they say, you know, that they think, feel as if he's a young maestro. Uh, that's not uh, words that they just throw around loosely. I mean, th they really mean it. After I'm finished blowing uh, some pieces, I will carve uh, patterns into the surface. So I, I blow colors uh, across the whole form and then I'll carve different scenes. The series of etched pieces that I have are called Manhattan Bowls. I display them with neon on the wall or uh, on a table. And each piece tells a story. Each, each uh, symbol adds up to the, the whole piece as, as a story. My career as a, a glass artist has been a career of change. I never stick with uh, an idea more than two years. Uh, I'm always interested in, in the next piece, not the piece that I've just made. So I expect to leave behind what I'm doing now and move on to uh, better things. I'm not trying to make great art when I sit down to make a piece. I'm trying to satisfy myself. Susan Zoon is certainly ahead of her time in the revival of Cubism from a very feminine point of view. I've been interested in art as long as I can remember, as far back as, uh, as I could pick up a crayon or hold a pencil. When uh, children in kindergarten, I remember distinctly, were drawing stick trees, you know, and stick figures, lollipop trees, and I was drawing fu fully fleshed out figures. And um, so I think it was just a matter of an increased uh, visual perception that I wasn't even cognizant of at the time. And I've taken a fairly convoluted path 
uh, to get to uh, what I'm doing today. I started uh, totally representationally. Michelangelo was my hero. And uh, I got very heavily into uh, drawing absolutely anatomically correct figures and uh, honing my technique when I didn't know that that's what I was doing. Uh, as late as when I went to art school in Mexico, I still had the feeling that modern art was just a refuge for artists that didn't have the proper technique, didn't have the right stuff. And so they found refuge in, uh, in modern art because they could sort of finagle the edges here and there and they wouldn't be judged too harshly, you know, criticized too harshly. And uh, boy, I was really wrong about that. <laughs> It took a lot of time for me to notice it, though. I had to come a long way. I got my technique to a point where um, it was so highly perfected, and I was so circumscribed by the technique that I had to look forward. For, you know, I had to look further than that in order to grow at all as an artist. I wasn't getting anywhere painting portraits. It didn't satisfy me, and it often wasn't satisfying the client because uh, unbeknownst to myself, I had already begun to grow beyond the strict realism that they expected from a portrait. And um, I said to myself, well, something is happening here. And that's when I began to uh, come to my philosophy of reaching beyond what we think we see, what we visually perceive, and going to what we, th uh, we think in our minds might be happening beyond our visual perception, just out of the reach of our visual perception. And I think that there are other realities out there. Cubism uh, was something that always fascinated me. When I looked at 20th century art, it's the only form of modern art that really uh, drew my attention. I never uh, had much luck connecting with the abstract expressionists, for example. I was always drawn to the surrealists, and the fauves and the cubists. And so what I came to was a distillation, almost, of those styles. And uh, what I wanted to do is go beyond what uh, Picasso and Leger and Brock and uh, those artists were saying politically about the mechanization of human beings and uh, uh, representing organic form in a robotic fashion. And I wanted to rehumanize it using the same sort of technique and the same idea, but rehumanize it so that people could connect with it. People that didn't know anything about art could look at something. It would be representational enough so that they could make a personal, emotional connection to the work. And uh, more, more importantly, that they could look at it and feel that it was attractive and even beautiful because I found that a lot of people think that modern art is ugly because sometimes it's a little too aggressive uh, for people that are not slowly indoctrinated to modern art. I go on, uh, you know, little outings with friends and we'll go to the art museum and uh, it's interesting to hear their opinions of work that I'm familiar with, you know, and uh, quite often they'll go to a Miro or they'll go to a Leger and they'll say, well, this is really beautiful. I can connect to this. Yet they'll look at a Jackson Pollock and they'll say, I think this is ugly and I don't get it. You see, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that work. It's just that I'm looking for a path where I can bring people to the realization that there is something more than what you see and that we have lives in our minds uh, that can be described in other ways. Elderly women have a tough time. <laughs> they generally outlive their men uh, in this society. Uh, and they're left alone. And it's very sad. Often they're left alone. If they have no children, they're left really alone. I had a, a mental image of my grandmother after my grandfather passed away. Uh, keeping tea for herself every afternoon, often alone. And it was very sad, but there was something very heroic about it at the same time. Because, uh, you know, life goes on and you make adjustments. And so it was a very personal thing for me to do. And I was really very happy with the way it turned out. In the sketch process, I generally start with the face. 
because they are still essentially portraits. And um, often I start with the eyes. And then I start framing around that with angles to suggest uh, facial planes, etc. And uh, knowing a person well, knowing a face well, has something to do with it. And it becomes then, starts to become that person as I play with it and work with it. And then I start to uh, fill in the surrounding uh, attitudes, how the, you know, the positioning of the character, what she's doing with the hands. And the hands are often really important. I want the hands to be a very big and strong and yet sensitive, soft in a way. And um, then I wanted to play with the inanimate objects. And that's something that I've been working with and working through. Because when I developed the style, I started with abstracting figures and faces. And then abstract, uh, you know, inanimate objects uh, became another, became sort of a problem. How to integrate them in with the, uh, with the emotional aspects of what I was trying to convey through the uh, subject of the painting and not have them be too harsh or too jagged or angular. And uh, that was sort of difficult. I had to work on that. But I'm starting to introduce more inanimate objects into my drawings and into my paintings. And so the teapot and tea for one was a real triumph for me. <laughs> to make it representational and easily identifiable and yet not too easy, not too present. In order to decide what I'm going to paint, what I'm going to sketch, I don't just sit down with a blank piece of, you know, piece of sketch pad and say, this is going to be T for one, this is going to be blind date, etc. What I do generally is I have in my sketch diary a number of ideas that I would like to touch upon and address. And as I start sketching, it's very free-flowing and very open. And when it starts to become something to me that might fit one of the descriptions of the sketchbook, then I start to zero in on what it will become. Then I start to tune it up. But it sort of happens very, uh, very freely and then develops and becomes tighter as I go along through the process. Uh, in the case of Josephine Baker, I tend to cut things out of magazines and out of newspapers, photographs that interest me artistically. And I was going through the New York Times magazine, and I saw this photograph of Josephine Baker. And uh, it, wasn't in, you know, it wasn't in conjunction with an article about Josephine Baker. I just happened to know a little bit about Josephine Baker because I've always been interested in artists that have had to find alternate routes to get where they're going. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And uh, she was one of those artists. And uh, in the magazine, it was just a fashion splash about uh, the resurgence of pearls on the fashion scene. And I cut it out, and I thought about it. And about a week later, I started to sketch. And um, as I was sketching, I said, this is, go this is going to be Josephine Baker. And so I got out my pencils, and I, I really went at it. Uh, she's a very interesting character, having, uh, being uh, this black girl in the United States who couldn't get work, who was a uh, jazz artist, dancer, and singer. Uh, they kept wanting to pigeonhole her as a specialty actor, a strip number, or you know, and she, that's not what she wanted. And she went to Europe, and she, while never losing her blackness, when she went to Europe, it was not an issue. And it was there that she became the bronze goddess. And that's what I was trying to capture in the painting, was the bronze goddess, was the triumphant woman that she had become. The sketch of Piano Man represents another interesting uh, phase in my development of this particular style in that I tend to look at a lot of my sketches and drawings in the developmental stages as experiments. I'm working on perfecting the style for myself. And so I was dealing with uh, a fairly large block in the left-hand side of the sketch of what is uh, 
relatively unarticulated negative space. And on the right side of the sketch, where the protagonist is playing the piano, uh, you know, that's positive space. And it's very light, and he's under possibly a single light. And so uh, he's almost totally washed out. And then everything else is in shadow. And um, as I started sketching it with the pencils, um, my uh, idea of what this man would be like started to evolve. How uh, he's playing in this dingy club and he's playing way below his abilities and uh, he could be out writing music and cutting record contracts and he's playing in a crummy bar and people don't understand him. And I think all of that came across in the sketch and then was transferred into the painting. But really the most important thing was for me to integrate the hands with the keyboard on the piano and uh, make it representational enough again so that people could connect with it and uh, still hold a little back, not give too much away because um, I, I think part of, the, uh, part of the beauty of living with something like this is that there's always something else to find. Prisoner of Ambition is about me and about a lot of performing artists. A lot of people that I ran into in my dealings with the opera company and the ballet company. People who had to make hard decisions about what they were willing to do, just how far they would go to get what they wanted, to get that fame, that success, that acclaim. I often think about that movie, uh, All About Eve, with Betty Davis, and there's a marvelous line in there about uh, where she says it's funny uh, when you think about the things that you dropped on the way up the ladder so that you could travel faster to get there. And uh, that's always intrigued me because it's true. You never really get anything unless you're willing to give something up to get it. And so here she is on the swing in her virginal white gown thinking as she's being pushed by the impresario just how far, just what she will do just how far she will go. And of course, she's already made a decision. I mean, she's on the swing and she's in the air, so it's, it's a little late for looking back. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't stop you from thinking about those things. <laughs> I think you'll agree that there always is something else to find in both Stephen and Susan's work. I thank them both for letting us visit them. And good night for Art Beat.